Good afternoon. I'm Al Gonzalez, the dean here at Belmont Law School. Welcome to this slightly delayed, but nonetheless very special conversation with the Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable John G. Roberts, Jr. John Roberts was appointed as the 17th Chief Justice of the United States in September 2005 after being nominated by President George W. Bush. At the time of his nomination to the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice was a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Prior to his appointment to the bench, the Chief Justice served as an Associate White House Counsel in the Ronald Reagan Administration, and later as Principal Deputy Solicitor General in the George H.W. Bush Administration. When not in government service, he worked in private practice in Washington, D.C. The Chief Justice earned an undergraduate degree from Harvard in 1976 with dreams of becoming a history professor. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Okay. <laughs> later, he earned a degree from Harvard Law School in 1979, after which he clerked for Judge Henry Friendly on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and later for Justice William Rehnquist on the U.S. Supreme Court. The Chief Justice is a proud Hoosier and an avid Notre Dame fan. Perhaps less well known, the Chief Justice is a fan of singer Bob Dylan and is quoted from Dylan in his written work. John Roberts is married to the former Jane Sullivan, also a lawyer, and they have a daughter, Josephine, and a son, Jack. Before turning it over to the Chief Justice for introductory comments, please join me again in giving him a warm Nashville welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, let me apologize for the uh, rescheduling. I heard the two most dreaded words for any traveler this morning, maintenance issues. Uh, and uh, I had planned to come uh, last night, so I would be sure to be here on time. But the Speaker of the House and the President of the United States decided to reschedule things. And the leader of the legislative branch and the leader of the executive branch didn't think they needed to consult with the judicial branch. Uh, uh, so between that and the airline uh, uh, difficulties this morning, I do apologize for, uh, for the uh, uh, rescheduling. Uh, this is not the first time that Judge Gonzalez has interviewed me. Uh, the first time was about 14 years ago uh, as the first step in the process that led to my current job. So in my experience, nothing but good things happen when you're interviewed by uh, <laughs> Judge Gonzalez. I hope the questions won't be the same. Back then, there were questions, you know, have you paid your taxes? Uh, uh. <laughs> and then my favorite, the one at the end, have you ever done anything embarrassing, or that would be embarrassing if it came out, either to you or to the president? And I gave, gave an answer, uh, and earlier, <laughs> I had asked the same question at a much, uh, when I was an associate White House counsel at a lower level, lower level appointees, and I asked the same question. If it, is there anything that, if it came out, would be embarrassing to uh, you or, uh, or, or the president? There's a long pause, and the person said, define embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was an issue, so we didn't it. Anyway, I am delighted to be here with uh, an old friend, delighted to be here with uh, all of you, and I'm looking forward to the questions. Well, these are questions uh, submitted by the faculty and students. Um, so these are, some of these are pretty tough. Okay. Chief. So let's start with this. We'll start with a, a softball, okay? Uh, I sometimes, I'm, sometimes I'm asked, what is it like to be Attorney General of the United States? So my question to you is, what's it like to be Chief Justice of the United States? What's it like? Well, um, uh, to be perfectly serious, I love the work. As a lawyer, the chance to do this kind of work, I love the work. Um, uh, I love that the work I'm doing is in the service of the country that I love. Uh, I'm delighted that I have such wonderful colleagues uh, to do it with, um, and I get to do it as long as I want. So what's not to like? <laughs> is that job security? I will say, though, <laughs> and, and I think this is important for, for the law students to uh, appreciate. Um, it obviously is a great responsibility, and, and I, I feel very blessed to have it. But there have been 17 chief justices, and I'd be very surprised if people in here could name, certainly nobody's going to be able to name all of them. Uh, and there have been very uh, significant people, um, uh, like Morrison Waite, uh, Melville Fuller, between them, the chief justices for about 30 years, nobody knows who they are. 
uh, Fred Vinson, maybe you know, uh, uh, Salman Chase, uh, John Rutledge, you probably don't know. He was Chief Justice for four and a half months. Our students probably know this. Well, my point, <laughs> my point is that um, uh, it's not, you're not guaranteed to play a significant role uh, in the history of your country, and it's not necessarily a bad thing if you don't. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, I feel very blessed to have the opportunity to, uh, to do it. And thanks for your help. How would you articulate your view of the role of the court in the con under our Constitution? Um, the interesting thing when you look at when you look at Article Three, it doesn't say anything about judicial review or you know uh, uh, assessing the legality of what the executive is going to do. The job starts. It says you have to decide cases and controversies, and I try to keep that in mind. The only reason we can say laws are unconstitutional or whatever is because of that. That's what. Marshall's genius in Marbury versus Madison was. If you've got to decide a case and the issue of the constitutionality of a law comes into effect, well, then you've got to decide that. Um, but you always have to keep your uh, eye on the fact that you're just deciding a case. That's why important doctrines like, like standing, is this really a case? Is this person really going to be hurt by what's happening? Uh, you have to uh, be very careful about that. And it's also, uh, you know, the framers knew what a judge was. It's one of the uh, great uh, benefits of our heritage from the English legal system. So when they say the judge has to decide cases and controversies, they obviously meant according to law, not according to uh, policy views. So I do try to keep that in mind too. You shouldn't be, uh, uh, the judicial branch shouldn't be resolving all sorts of policy decisions that belong in the other branches. It, it's something that people lose sight of, but if you look at uh, and I'm one who thinks the courts are deciding too many of, of those sorts of issues. Um, the, the people who drafted the Constitution, um, uh, you know, most of whom had risked their lives in the Revolution, uh, uh, and all of whom had taken, undertaken great sacrifices to have the opportunity to govern themselves, they would not have sat around in Constitution Hall and said, I've got an idea. Let's pick a handful of guys who aren't elected, uh, who can't be uh, replaced, and let's have them make all the hard decisions. So you do kind of have to keep in mind it's a very, it's, it's a, a modest, important, but modest role. Do you have a favorite passage in the Constitution? Um, no, uh, but what I do have, and this is, from my point of view anyway, important. The most important thing about the Constitution is not a passage. It's not due process, it's not equal protection, it's not uh, that, it's, it's the Constitution, it's the structure. Um, uh, the, the, bill of, uh, the, the Constitution is itself a Bill of Rights. Somebody said that, I forget, forget whom. And the fact that our liberties are protected most efficiently by the fact that there is an executive branch distinct from the legislative branch and there's a judicial branch. That structure uh, is what uh, makes the Constitution work, more important than any particular, particular phrase. If I had to pick one, it would be the preamble. I mean, it's, it's you know, we the people. That's the important fact, uh, that um, uh, today is uh, Ronald Reagan's birthday, and if you go back and look at his speeches, he talks about that phrase a lot. Uh, uh, you know, it wasn't a particular uh, uh, clan, it wasn't a particular uh, royal family who set this up, it was we, you know, we the people. Uh, and you have to, uh, that, that's an extraordinary accomplishment. You know, many court watchers believe your style is to look to achieve a greater consensus on the court. And as I told you at lunch, uh, one of the reasons President Bush selected you to be the Chief Justice is because of your personality. He felt that as Chief Justice, you had the, the personality that could bring the court together on very divis divisive issues. And so, um, do you think you're making progress towards that goal in terms of achieving consensus, less 5-4 decisions, or not? Well, you know, some days are better than others, I guess is the best uh, way to put it. Um, I think it's something worth working at. Um, uh, but you know, uh, I have eight uh, extraordinarily accomplished uh, colleagues who work hard and have a particular view, and uh, uh, they, they, I think, also are committed to having us work together as much as possible. Um, I think a, a unanimous or close to unanimous decision is much more uh, uh, effective, uh, much more acceptable uh, than a sharply divided 5-4 or even worse, you know, 4-3-2. Uh, 
Um, but it, it's not like you compromise. It's not like, well, I think it violates the First Amendment, and you don't, you know, let's meet halfway or something. You can't do that. But I think if you, if you talk things out a little bit longer, um, uh, from my perspective, I think it's good to have a narrow decision. And the narrower the decision, the more likely you are to get people to agree with it. It's when you start you know, branching out that people fall off. I don't know how many people know how long you know, Earl Warren's decision in Brown versus Board of Education was. It was, I think, about 12 pages. And you get the sense that he wanted unanimity in that. And that's a perfect example how significant that was. You know, if he had written another paragraph, you know, people would start saying, no, I'm not, I don't agree with that. I'm not going to go along with that. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I do think it's a worthy objective, you know, not at all costs. I mean, if you have strongly held views on a particular approach to a case and that results in a five to four decision, well, you know, that's the way it is. But I do think it's worth trying to get broader agreement. I think it's fair to say that as a Chief Justice, you ha do have some extra burdens than perhaps your colleagues on the court. How does, it, does your job affect your family and your personal life as a general matter? You know, not, not very much. Uh, it, it, um, uh, to a certain extent, it's easier. You have more flexibility. I mean, when I was a practicing lawyer, you know, if your brief was due the next day, it was due the next day. And if, you know, your child had a play or something, you know, you'd have to really work carefully to make sure you could go. Um, you know, the opinions aren't due the next day. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're due when you're done. Uh, uh, Must be that's nice. Not, that's not quite true. We, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing at the court that our practice is we do not rise for the summer until all the opinions are done. We don't carry anything over. Uh, we try to get out before the 4th of July, uh, and so that's an effective deadline, and June is a busy month. Uh, uh, but to a certain extent, it gives you a greater degree of flexibility, um, uh, and the you know, the price we pay, uh, the, the benefit we get for working pretty hard from Labor Day to the Fourth of July is that July and August are pretty open. We have to work, and emergencies come up, but and that allows you a lot of time to spend with the family and all as, as, as well. So many describe you as easygoing and a regular type of person. So what does the Chief Justice do to relax? And as Chief Justice, can you travel without being recognized? Did people on Southwest this morning recognize that you were the Chief Justice of the United States? You know, a couple people did. Um, um, uh, the, the people not on Southwest, but the other airline um, that will go nameless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm glad they didn't, because they were angry. And, and I think they would have found some way to blame me for it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You know, a couple of people do, and, and I've, I've uh, almost always, to the extent people uh, interact with you, it's almost always been very positive. Um, in fact, one time a woman came up to me and, and went on at great length how pleased she was with a particular opinion and how grateful and how good that was for the court to do that. And I just not, I didn't have the heart to tell her I dissented. But <laughs> 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 Okay, so <laughs> you clerked for Justice Rehnquist yes. when he was on the court. What was that experience like, and what are some differences you see in the court and in the clerkship experience between now and then? The, um, it was a wonderful opportunity to clerk for Justice Rehnquist. He was um, uh, very open with his clerks. Uh, he w it was a, uh, One thing I liked about him, and I've tried to carry it forward in my chambers, he, he was a much more oral emphasis than written. A lot of places, you know, the judge will say, okay, I want a memo on this or a memo on that. And, and, and he did that too, and I do. But more for him it was, uh, was oral, which it can be much more difficult. You say, you want to write a bench memo, tell me what this case is about, and you go and you write and all that, as opposed to, I want you to learn it, and then the next day, sit down and say, all right, what is this case about? And he'll have questions. So you, it can be harder uh, on the clerk. But it does, um, I find it helpful to organize thoughts. I did this when I was writing briefs as a lawyer um, by talking about them. Um, uh, too often, I, I see people sit down and say, oh, I've got to do this, okay, and then they get out a pen and start writing. Um, you need to spend more time, I think, and I need to, to remind myself to th uh, thinking before you start writing. And putting yourself in a position where you're going to have to do an oral presentation or listen to one, um, I think really does allow you the opportunity to, to focus more without getting bogged down in 
and putting words on paper, which you're going to have to do later, but not at the beginning. So when you author an opinion, it, who is the audience? Who, uh, do, who are you thinking about when you, when you write an opinion? My sisters. There are, I have three sisters. They are not lawyers. Uh, they're intelligent uh, lay people who you know, aren't fixated on what's going on in Washington, certainly not fixated in the, the legal world, but like to keep up you know, it. And, and that's kind of, you know, I guess what they used to, you know, the, the, the man on the street. I, I really hope that whatever area of law it's in, and we obviously deal with very technical areas, that somebody who's not a lawyer can pick it up and read it and go, okay, well, I understand what this is about, uh, uh, and I understand why this person won, um, and, you know, be able to, to follow it. So um, it's interesting. Other judges view it differently. Some judges like to write for the lawyers. You know, these are the people involved. They want to make sure they understand why their client won or lost. Others like to write for uh, academics. You know, this is a particularly interesting area of the law, and they want the theorists to understand where it fits in. Um, I like to write for my sisters. We've gone through some uh, interesting, tough confirmations recently. Uh, obviously, Justice Kavanaugh's con confirmation was a little bit extraordinary. You once served in the executive branch. Is there anything you wish was emphasized more in choosing justices or questions that you wish were asked in the vetting or confirmation process that really aren't being asked today? Um, I've said this before, so I think I'll just say it again. I think the process is uh, uh, not working the way it's supposed to. Uh, all too often you have uh, uh, members of the committee asking questions um, that they know the nominee can't fairly answer for you know, reasons of their own, and then the nominee having to give answers that aren't answers. You know, how are you going to rule on this? What do you think about this case? Well, it's inappropriate to ask a nominee that and inappropriate for a nominee to answer, and yet you kind of go through all that um, uh, anyway. So I, I don't think that's helpful. Um, you know, if I were a senator, what would I ask? I, you know, I, I think it's hard. It's hard to come up with questions that let you get into uh, a nominee's understanding of the Constitution, uh, uh, what she thinks about the proper role of the court, uh, things like that. But I don't know, questions like, uh, you know, what, what are your favorite books and why? And what do you learn from this particular book that you like? What was the message of that? Uh, uh, talk about other decisions that you've made and how you've made those. Not legal decisions, but you know, I don't, any decisions about anything to get a sense about you know, how their mind works, uh, you know, it's, uh, how analytic uh, it is. Uh, you know, ask people what's important to them. Uh, obviously ask them about how they understand law. You know, not just you know, our American legal system, but you know, more, more in general. Um, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a significant concept uh, that we don't, particularly lawyers, you're kind of wrapped up in going about it, but, you know, in the, the uh, uh, words of uh, uh, where I went to school that you get when you confer a law degree on you, they talk about being learned in the wise restraints that make men free. Uh, well, that's an interesting concept about you know, law is a restraining force to facilitate greater freedom. I, I think maybe if you talk to people at a more abstract level, you can learn a lot about them and, and, and make a judgment about, well, does this person seem to be somebody who is thoughtful, uh, uh, who, you know, it's like anything else. If you ask people, you know, what are your favorite books and they can't think of one, you know, that, that tells you something. Uh, uh, but. Uh, you know, and yes, the questions are vague uh, and, and subject to, you know, interpretation, but they're more useful than how you're going to rule on this issue and the person say, I can't tell you, and, you know. Yeah, this, I don't think we ask this of Supreme Court nominees, the question of, okay, give me your favorite justice or judge and tell me why. Would that be an appropriate question or not? I think it is yeah. um, uh, because... Um, now, I was asked that question, and I don't know if I dodged it or not, but uh, I, I s went through. You gave the right answer, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just you, you, you admire different attributes in different justices. Uh, you know, I would like to be able to write like Justice Jackson. I mean, you know, it's like a kid who plays basketball. I, I want to be Mike. It's not 
it, it seems presumptuous, but you know that's how it's, it's done. And and you want to have the analytic force of of of, of Frankfurter. You want to have, uh, particularly if you're going to be a chief justice, the uh, uh, ability to work with people that John Marshall had. Um, uh, now you're not going to, but it's a good goal, and it's a good thing to kind of study uh, how these people did it uh, uh, to to learn from it. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, you know anonymous chief justices, um, uh, and uh, it struck me that that would have been an embarrassing question from the Judiciary Committee. Okay, you're going to be the 17th chief justice. Name the previous 16. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I've heard of Marshall and Jay and you know uh, Earl Warren and some others, but uh, you know I probably would have gotten two out of th three. So um, early on, I went and I said, well, I should learn something about these people, and, and uh, uh, it is illuminating. You find out what their particular challenges were, and I mean, you've, you, you uh, learn about how Charles Evans Hughes dealt with FDR and the court packing plan, what's the difference between the way Marshall uh, addressed the fundamental issues in Marbury versus Madison and how Tawney addressed the issues in Dred Scott, and, and uh, um, so it's, it's you don't have one favorite, uh, I think. You do find different attributes and different ones that are worth emulating. I once was the junior member of a state Supreme Court and had duties like making sure coffee was available for conferences. So what special duties does the newest member on the court have? And can you describe how the court changes every time a new member joins? Well, it's a great tradition we have. I think it is sort of like hazing. The first thing that happens <laughs> happens to a new member of the court is they are assigned to the cafeteria committee. Um, uh, justices serve on various committees. You know, we have the budget committee that tries to get money from uh, uh, Congress. We even have a technology committee that deals with those issues. We have a cafeteria committee, and that's the first job for a new justice. So when they come in and think, you know, they're, you know, this is a big deal, I'm a justice, then they sit down with people complaining about uh, you know, the bagels uh, <laughs> or something. And just as you said, the junior justice always has the responsibility of answering the door. When we're in conference, nobody else is, is allowed in, and if there's a knock on the door, the junior justice has to get up and uh, uh, used to be Justice Scalia's coffee, usually, that was being delivered. Uh, uh, but uh, and that's a, a, a good responsibility uh, uh, that we give to the junior justice. What was the rest of the, the second half of your question? Uh, how does the court change? Oh, and this may how be it evident, changes. but yeah, Byron sense? White said that uh, everybody changes when there's a new member, um, and I think there is a lot to that. Uh, the first thing I would say is that we uh, are on better behavior for a short while. I mean, it is like <laughs> it is like having uh, uh, you know a new in-law for Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, you 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 want to you're showing off, right? Like, Not so much showing off, but you don't want to say right? <laughs> uh, and. I do think one thing it does is cause everybody to start thinking a little, maybe refreshing their uh, views on things because you've been with the, you know, the other uh, seven people for a long time. They know what you think about statutory interpretation. They don't need to hear it from you again. But here's somebody new. And so, okay, I need to explain to him or her, this is how I read statutes. And it causes you to say, well, I got to think, you know, what is it? Uh, again, look at it a little fresher. And the new person's going to have different perspectives as well, and you need to react to those. So it is, it is, there is a period of kind of uh, maybe sort of learning a little bit more and reminding yourself about why you think of things and being open to new, new views. I'd say it lasts about 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the caseload of the court has decreased over the years. Why do you think that is? Uh, would you like to see the court issue more opinions. Do you see a difference in the quality of opinions given the fact that there are fewer opinions coming out of the court? Yeah. Um, when I was a law clerk in 1980, the court issued uh, 150 opinions. Uh, today we issue about half that. And I will say it's, to me and I think to many others, a great mystery. We don't quite know why. Um, uh, I, you know, you come up with many different theories. Um, uh, there were a few mandatory appeals that the court had to take, but only about 15 or so. That doesn't really account for a lot of it. Then they ab abolished that, that jurisdiction. Um, the, 
big pieces of legislation. They say, well, we haven't passed any big pieces of legislation for a long time, so you don't have that fallout. So maybe we'll see that in a little bit, because we ha there have been big pieces, you know, Dodd-Frank and uh, uh, Obamacare, and so maybe there'll be more cases coming out of those. Uh, my latest uh, pet theory is uh, technology. Uh, back when I was a law clerk, it wasn't all at all rare for you to get a case where there's a conflict. I mean, that's where we get most of our cases. You know, one court says this, and the other, another court on the same thing says that, and we will take that to resolve it. But I think it was not unusual to say, okay, well, people just didn't know that the New Hampshire Supreme Court had issued an opinion on that. Because you, you, know, you go to all these thick books and you're flipping around and maybe you see it or not. Now you all just press a button and you've got every case. So there are no uh, uh, inadvertent uh, uh, conflicts uh, like there, there used to be. You know, you are sometimes referred to, as, of course, as a Bush appointee, Justice Kavanaugh, referred to as a Trump appointee, as if these labels. Tell us something about your jurisprudence. Um, should people think about the court and the justices differently than just being either a conservative or a liberal justice? Well, sure. Uh, first of all, the categories um, aren't that significant in a particular case. Uh, the, in many areas of the law, the most uh, uh, pro-criminal defendant justice uh, was Justice Scalia. Um, his way of analyzing some of the protections in the Bill of Rights led him to believe that um, uh, criminal defendants had a lot more rights uh, uh, and more categorical rights than many of, of uh, his colleagues. Um, and you can go down the line with that. Um, I don't know if where you put conservative or liberal in the First Amendment area, um, uh, but I, I think I'm probably the most uh, uh, aggressive defender of the First Amendment on the court. Now, I think most people might think that doesn't quite fit uh, with my jurisprudence in other areas. Um, and there are many cases where it's just hard to categorize a result. I mean, it, it, you know, is this a conservative result or a liberal result? Um, and there are many instances where the lineups are not going to be the usual ones you might expect. Um, uh, on the court in particular legal issues. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a shorthand, a lot of people use it. The press in particular, they use it a lot because it's just, you know, they've, they've got only so many words they can put and they think that uh, uh, helps uh, uh, get a message across, but I think it's very misleading. Uh, Is the lack of public knowledge of the role and powers of the Supreme Court a problem uh, in your eyes? If so, why and how are you and other members trying to address that? Uh, it is a problem, um, uh, and I think it's becoming increasingly problematic with the political polarization you see, particularly not just the most recent, but in several confirmation hearings. I mean, if you have, the, well, the one thing that many people just don't realize about the court is we're just not another part of the political process. Um, uh, but you can understand how somebody would think that if you're seeing a confirmation hearing where Democrats and Republicans and party line votes and going that, you have to assume the person who comes out of that process reflects that same, uh, same division. Um, uh, and that historically has not been the case. Uh, there have been many, many judges, justices appointed by Republican presidents who turn out to be much more uh, liberal, I guess, than you would expect, and, and some vices, vice versa as well. Um, uh, so. People need to know that we're not doing politics. They need to know that we're doing something different, um, that we're applying the law. They need to know that even if they, they, they think that's not the case. They need to, people should be able to read our opinions and we explain what we do and if they don't think that's a fair explanation, they, they should be able to make that judgment that this was not, you didn't sort of stick with your job, you made a political decision because I've looked at your opinion and that doesn't hold together. And, uh, but they can't make that kind of criticism if they don't appreciate that we're supposed to be doing something different. You know, the court is sometimes criticized for its decisions. Really? I know that's a shock. Um, <laughs> is there an appropriate way for a justice to respond to such criticism? Um, no, I don't think there is. Um, uh, first of all, it doesn't bother me in the least that our opinions are criticized. Um, uh, they should be if people think 
they're wrong. Um, uh, you know, it's a free country, and uh, part of that is the ability to criticize uh, people in the uh, in the uh, in the government, and it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, you know, if it's more informed criticism, that's better. Uh, uh, in the sense, they know what we're supposed to be doing, and they know why they don't like uh, uh, what we're doing. But the idea of a, a judge or a justice, you know, responding to the criticism is is, uh, is is it's not a good one. Among other things, because. Uh, you know, if you try to defend, you know, you say, well, I don't like your opinion in this. If I try to defend it, the first thing that y you realize, well, it's not just my opinion. I mean, ho hopefully I got, you know, at least four other people to go along with me. And I can't try to defend it as my own because others might not feel quite the same that that's, you know, in terms of uh, what you ought to be uh, emphasizing. Um, uh, and uh, the opinion sort of speaks for itself. Um, so it doesn't do any good to try to get into a back and forth with anybody uh, over, over your opinions. You spoke earlier about how uh, perhaps the, the technology is changing the way the court operates. I think we can all agree that technology is changing the practice of law generally. Uh, so we have a constitution that's over 200 years old. How do you think the court will address the changes of interpreting law in our modern, ever-changing society of science and, techn and technology? Um, it's challenging, uh, you know, um, uh, just because every time, you know, when you age, the technology changes so fast, you can't keep up with it. Uh, uh, and um, we need good lawyers to, to brief us on, explain to us how this particular technological tool works. Um, some of us are better than others. Uh, uh, you know, Justice Thomas is the most technologically sophisticated on the court. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know that I'd say I'm the least, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> probably the, in there in the competition. But, but um, uh, you know, it, it, you do have to keep your, the one thing you have to be careful not to do, and I think this is true, is to get wrapped up in all the technology. Um, we had a, a case about cell phones, and it was a question whether you needed a search warrant to right. open, a, open a cell phone. Um, and you, you, know, you have to educate yourself on well, how does that all work, what are they? But it gets down to basic principles. And you, know, you say, well, what do you have on your cell phone? You know, well, you've got obviously people you call, you've got names and addresses, you've got now you know, your shopping uh, 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 records, your diaries, um, everybody you talk to, when you talk to, and you actually have a lot more on that than you might know in terms of everywhere you've been, all this other mm -hmm. stuff. Um, uh, and you ask yourself, okay, do you need a search warrant? Well, that came from the Fourth Amendment. What, you know, the framers were worried about uh, uh, the British soldiers coming in and kicking down your door and rifling through your, your desk drawers. Um, now, what would you rather protect if you had to? The, are you worried about the police rummaging through your desk drawers or more about them rummaging through your cell phones? Everybody, even, you know, Older people like me would say, I don't want to look at my cell phone. I mean, yeah, there's stuff I would rather protect in private in my desk drawers, but the cell phone has got so much more. So then you think, well, then maybe it makes sense to apply the Fourth Amendment requirement for a search warrant to, uh, uh, to the cell phone because it contains, as you know, the court said in that opinion, the privacies of life in a way that uh, uh, you know, uh, devices like that never did before. So it's yes, it's something new, it's a new thing, but you got to go back to the old principles. And, um, you know, everybody thinks this is such, a, and it is, the technological change is dramatic. But we've done this before. I mean, uh, railroads were new. I mean, how do you apply the Commerce Clause to railroads? Um, uh, why, you know, telephones, um, uh, that's a good example. The first time there was a wiretap, the court said, uh, that's, that's, that's not an, you know, that's not breaking in anywhere, that's not a search, um, uh, there's no protection. Well, but then as people got a little more accustomed to how these phones worked and what it was, and they changed. No, you know, that is protected uh, uh, by, the, by the Fourth Amendment. So um, technological change, the pace is probably a lot faster now than before. Um, uh, but it's, it's, the Constitution was written in terms that are broad enough to deal with technological innovations. So last night you were at the State of the Union with just three other of your colleagues. Right. 
Is it important for the court to have a presence at the State of the Union? And can you share some reasons justices have not attended in the past? You know, to be honest with you, uh, I have gone back and forth on that. Um, uh, and it may have something to do with my position. I don't know. I've gone to everyone since I've been there. I don't know that I would have done that if I were an associate justice. Um, I have some colleagues who feel that it's very important for us to be there because it's a important civic ceremony. There aren't other occasions where you get all of the branches, uh, the three branches of government there, the diplomatic corps. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a moving civic uh, ceremony. Um, and so, the, and we're part of the government and so we should be there. Uh, sometimes I think that. Other times, you know, it is a, as I said once, uh, it's a political pep rally. Um, and why are we there? I mean, you know, the, uh, it's a both parties. The presidents are laying out what they want to do, and there's hoot hooting and hollering on one side, and, uh, you know, the opposite. And, and, you know, the hard part is, it, according to protocol and good sense, we don't, we sit there. Um, and and uh, except sometimes we don't. And that is, and it's a very hard call to make. I mean, obviously, if the president is, you know, recognizing uh, uh, a hero or someone who has been suffering, you want to, and you do, join in and participate. And uh, if, you know, they're recognizing the sacrifices our troops make. And so I will stand up and applaud. But then all of a sudden it shifts from, you know, here, the, the, you know, the sacrifices our troops have made and we support them and you're playing. And that's why we need to, to fund, you know, the M1 tank. And, well, I can't do that. You, you sort of, <laughs> you're popping up and down. And, and uh, uh, so, you know, and there is a sense uh, uh, of that. Um, so, and there have been occasions where the court has been sort of singled out during the remarks, and that's not, a, uh, that's not appropriate uh, because we're there sort of as a captive audience uh, and not allowed to show uh, uh, emotion, and so I don't, that's a reason uh, perhaps not to go. So I do go back and forth. I actually haven't missed one, so I suppose the arguments in favor of it, at least so far, have outweighed the, the ones against it. It can be intimidating. There are other people, just to be, Sorry. there are other people in the same position. The, right where we s sit sort of in the front and then right along the side, the chiefs of staff are there. And they're the same way. Well, you don't want the military applauding, you know, health care proposals at all or all that. And so it, we, we sort of kind of look at each other. We say, <laughs> okay, are you going to stand up? I don't know. Are you going to stand up? And, and, uh, uh, and other people, you know, the librarian of Congress, the capital physician, all these, it, some people are in the same boat. You know, it can be intimidating standing before the justices in court. Uh, other than knowing the record and being respectful, is there any advice you have for someone arguing before the court? Sure. Um, I used to argue before the court, and I can assure you You're I You're pretty good at it, as I recall. Well, uh, a lot of people thought I was good after I wasn't doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> my, my reputation rose dramatically when I became Chief Justice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would be much better if I picked it up again than I was before I became a judge. And I, I'm sure you had the same experience. Um, uh, as a lawyer arguing, you really have to put yourself in the position of your audience. It's like anything else, a judge. So um, uh, appreciate the challenge you know, that she faces in kind, trying to come to a decision and have sufficient dispassion so that you, you act kind of as an ally. So when the judge says, well, how do you distinguish the Johnson case? You know, she's not going to ask you that question if the Johnson case is a good case for you. And you're not going to help if you start saying, oh, well, the Johnson case is different. It was about this and this. You know, she knows the Johnson case was different. That's why she asked you about it. And you have to understand that uh, you want to put yourself, if your first answer is, oh, that's different, you're immediately erecting a wall. And the judge thinks, now I've got to sort of press and press to try to get him to answer the question. You're now adversaries. If you say something instead, like, uh, you know, I appreciate that the Johnson case is not helpful to my side, or uh, the Johnson case is one that I wish weren't there, but here's why it doesn't <laughs> matter. Here's why it doesn't matter. And then you have an answer, and if you're prepared, you'll have an answer. And then the ju judge or justice thinks, well, okay, this person isn't trying to, you know, fool me. Uh, uh, he appreciates why I'm asking the question, and he's trying to give me an answer. The worst thing is you get uh, uh, people, both sides, it's a simple statute, and the one person said, the plain language of the statute clearly shows that I win. And the next person gets up, well, the plain language of the statute, 
because those lawyers are then telling you one way or another you're going to be stupid because you're not going to disagree with them. And imagine how much more, how, how refreshing it is to have somebody get up and say, you know, this language, you know, I can understand how you would look at this and, you know, whatever, the regulation seems to support uh, my friend on the other side. Uh, but this case shows you that, you know, realize, put yourself in the judge's position. This is a hard case. It wouldn't be, you know, where it is if it, if it weren't. And if you try to treat it as a simple one, um, you're just, you're not helping the judge or justice at all. Okay, we're about out of time. This is a final question. You know, I, I became a lawyer because I wanted to have a profession where I would make a difference. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts or advice for the students in law school here about what a career in law should be? Well, um, you know, the reality is uh, there are a lot of people uh, in our profession um, who are, are unhappy. I would say. Um, and you do hear law lawyers complaining a, a lot, you know, they don't really like their job and all that. And I think that's because a lot of people going through law school uh, forget why they wanted to be lawyers. Um, and it's easy to get, you know, distracted and moving in different paths and sometimes you have obligations, you know, time and chance kind of affect uh, uh, all of us. But if you went to law school because you wanted to be a lawyer in court, that's what you really liked, well, you should try to keep that in mind and try to achieve that. Don't think you're going to be happy if you wanted to go to be a lawyer in court and you end up doing you know, tax law. Uh, you shouldn't be surprised that you're not happy. Um, uh, not, no, true. no, I mean, I don't mean tax law. <laughs> <as a bad. laughs> I mean, if you're not doing what you wanted to do, and now obviously you can change, and that's important. but don't sort of get categorized. I mean, the thing about the law is it covers so much, so many different types of lawyers, so many different things you can do. Uh, so you may find that you really do like doing something else uh, than what you went to law school for. But if you have a particular view, you know, kind of keep that in mind and at least ask yourself, okay, uh, you know, I'm in my third year of law school. I've got to figure out what to do. You know, why is it that I went here in the first place? And if it was to achieve particular social and policy ends, you went because you wanted to be an environmental lawyer because you cared about that, well then you ought to be careful to make sure the next step is consistent with that. Uh, otherwise you're going to be unhappy and I think that's why a surprising number of people are unhappy uh, in, the, uh, in the profession. Mr. Chief Justice, thank you for coming to Belmont and thank you for your service to our nation. Thank you. Well thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Thank all of you.